last speaker is Reverend Mandy Bristol Leverett. The title of her talk is Human Trafficking is Here in New Jersey, What We Can Do About It. Reverend Mandy Bristol Leverett, founder and executive director of CAN and NJCAHT Church and Community Abolition Network, empowers church and community to do abolition, including prevention, detection, action, advocacy, and survivor care. Mandy assisted her first teenage victim of human trafficking when she was 14, providing you are, proving you are never too young to be a game changer. I think it's interesting that I, I you know, what, what was just shared about sleep, because I'm sleep deprived at the moment, so if I bomb, I'm just playing on that. I mean, and I think all of us can probably use a little volume right now. Fascinating. I've been I've been taking mental notes and, and giving myself notes um, on what has been said. It's amazing. Um, my name is Mandy, and I, I want to bring to you some awareness um, that many people don't know about. And so we're we're going to kind of delve in this very quickly together. Um, I think it's interesting that we started with skydiving, and our adrenaline was pumping. I was like, sign me up, and then we're talking about sleep. I'm like, oh. I, I need that nap. Power nap. Right after you see me in my car, I'll be napping. Um, thank you all so much. I'm wondering, if I told you um, the most powerful weapon that we have to combat human trafficking is you, would you believe me? Those aren't my words. Those are Senator Chiesa's words. He was a former attorney general. And his words are 100% correct. Because we can have um, the best laws, and we do. Um, our coalition, the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking, which I'm a part of, and I'm actually leading that group, um, we wrote the law that is the toughest in the nation. We were the first state to prosecute a, a trafficker under state's law. We are also the first state to, to use vacature, completely wipe someone's record clean that was a victim of human trafficking. We're really breaking ground, but it's a slow process. Laws take time. Implementing the laws take time. And so um, that's what we do. Um, as, as it says right here, CAN empowers community to do abolition, including prevention, detection, action, advocacy, and survivor care. We assist in rescues and referrals nationwide. And we also retrofit existing community services to serve to serve survivors. So we kind of, we don't like to recreate the wheel. We like to make hybrids. Um, but also, where there are no services, we work collaboratively with some of the best organizations with the best outcomes and practices to bring those locally, to bring those services locally. So we're actually opening two sur um, human trafficking survivor homes and addiction homes this year in New Jersey. Um, and their rate of success is 86% which is unheard of for both addiction services and victims of human trafficking. So that's just one part of what we do. Ultimately, we are empowering the people, connecting community to end slavery. And so CAN is just one, just one of, of over 100 different organizations that come together just in New Jersey. Our purpose is uniting New Jersey communities to end slavery. And our membership are organizations like student-led organizations. We have um, political organizations, faith-based organizations. We have FBI. We have uh, legislators. We have just about every kind of organization you can think of. That, and some of these organizations would never come to the table for any other reason but to end slavery. Some of them are organizations that are each other's nemesis. I can tell you during this presidential election season, they were definitely on different sides of the table. But we are all passionate and respectful, and we can come together for this purpose. So um, I want to invite you to become a part of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. There's so much we can do together. Um, but today I want, I want to bring awareness in a general sense, but I also want to bring you action points. Because like I've found, um, I've been doing this for, for decades now. Um, as, a, as an adult professional. As was mentioned, for, when I was 14 years old, I assisted the first victim of human trafficking I would ever assist. I didn't know it was a victim of human trafficking. It was a pregnant teenager who lived, it was, she was homeless, lived in, um, I, 
I went to high school in the, um, just outside of Seattle. So in the valley of Mount Rainier, um, literally next to the Glacier River water, she was homeless and she was being beaten um, and she was being sold by her boyfriend. And so I didn't know what to do, but I knew I, I could ask people for help that knew what to do. And so I began what I understand now is service provision. <laughs> but, and it's funny that you would mention about REM sleep because I had a dream when I was, when I was 12 that I would be rescuing slaves. We didn't know, until I was in college, we didn't, in the early 90s, we didn't know that slavery existed today. And it's just interesting how, for whatever reason, our dreams can inform us. And so much of those, those uh, you know, billiard ball can really guide our steps. I can tell you everything that I've gone through in my past has served me well today. They, and seemingly really random things have informed me and helped me. And, um, and I hope that you feel the same sense of your purpose in life. Um, because we're not human doings, we're human beings. And we bring intrinsic value, we are intrinsically valued. And so we, we can't sell each other. No one should own you. Now that's not um, a globally agreed upon idea. We're Western educated, so we, we tend to think that's how everybody thinks, but not really. Um, I want to talk to you about our law, and then we'll talk about some other areas that express that very thing that I'm talking about. Um, our law is the toughest in the nation. Um, our law basically says it's in agreement with our federal law, which says um, a victim of human trafficking is someone that is being sold um, for cash or goods or services. And there is force, fraud, or coercion that is keeping them bound. Not always chains or anything like that. In fact, most of the time it's not chains. And so this force, fraud, or coercion keeps them there. And our human trafficking law also recognizes both federal and state that there is no such thing as teenage prostitution. If you are a minor, you are automatically considered a victim of human trafficking, even if you say you're not. Because even in states like our state, we have um, age of consent laws. So in New Jersey, it's 16. There are other states different. Our human trafficking laws, both federal and state, trump that law. So if, it, if someone is being trafficked and they are a minor, they are automatically considered a victim of human trafficking. And you, they don't even need to um, prove force, fraud, or coercion. Um, there are lots, several myths about human trafficking that I want to dispel before we go into what it looks like globally and in the United States. Um, one of the myths is, it can't happen to, to me or to anyone I know. It's someone else's problem. All the, all the poor overseas, all those poor people in the other country, all those poor foreign nationals. I want to tell you, actually, in the, in the United States, the majority of victims of human trafficking, 83% of the slaves in America today were born here. So that changes how we even identify a slave. And of those people who, who are being enslaved, whether they're foreign born or in the United States, of those people who are being enslaved, most of them started to be enslaved between the ages of 11 and 14. So they met their trafficker in that very young, so we're talking about fifth grade, because some students are in fifth grade still in 11, fifth grade all the way to ninth grade. So let that sink in for a minute. These are the facts that we're finding out. And we're, it's an emerging awareness. Initially, about 15, 20 years ago, we thought it was just uh, foreign nationals coming in, being duped and used, but we're, as we are doing the work, we're realizing this is completely different. Um, our overseas agencies have been aware of, the, of this longer. Um, and so we, we look to them sometimes to help in our service provision to advise us because they've been healing it the longest. So what does it look like? And I'll talk about some other myths as we go along. Another one is that um, if you are undocumented and you come forward and say, this is happening to me, that you will be deported. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you are identified as a victim of human trafficking, there are more services for you than there are for nationally born um, victims of human trafficking. 
There are T visas, housing, job, there are all sorts of resources. So if you know someone that, that is afraid to get help for that reason, please tell them. And use the national hotline number, which I'll, we'll show you in a minute. Um, it's it's kind of easy to remember. It's 888-3737-888. And there's a text, a national human trafficking hotline number, 24-7, multilingual um, text and, and phone call. Oh, just freedom, one call away. It's be free. It'll be up here in a minute, but I just wanted to let you know those are some really important areas that we want to make sure we're on the same page about. So this can happen to anywhere or anyone anywhere. And it, it really can. I mean, I, I can tell you so many stories about um, young people, especially the tween age. They make apps just geared to them. They were, uh, I, some girls were telling me about, some girls I was mentoring were telling me about this, this new app, this is a few years ago, called Talking Angela. Anybody hear of that? One, two, all right. <laughs> Most people are like, no, because there's like, that's like an eon ago of apps. But this app could, could turn on your GPS, and it was a friend, right? And, and middle school girls especially, it's a t a, you know, had a catty time in their lives. And, um, you know, they, they said, you know, I, I like to have that positive person in my life on my cell phone, a stranger, by the way. Who, but that app can turn on your GPS, so it can know where you are at any time. It can take videos and pictures of you without you knowing. And so some of the, these middle school girls were telling me, oh yeah, we, were in the, we went into the bathroom and, and our friend has this app on her phone and, and, and it texted her, oh, you look so cute today, let's take a pic. That's how invasive strangers can be. I have another friend of mine who her daughter was gaming on the television, you know, not even on her device. She was gaming on her television in the suburbs, nice community, good family, very protective. And she was gaming with a stranger. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was 15, her 16-year-old sister intercepted a message. Um, she was gonna meet up with this person, she's gaming. So the 16-year-old sister tells her mom. And so mom uh, talks to the police, and the police find this guy within a block radius of her house. And he has a list of half a dozen other students and their addresses in the area. And he's a man from Croatia. Mm -hmm. That's how you can live in, in the sticks. We're developing some service homes that are in the country of New Jersey, and you can be way out there. And international traffickers can find you. But it's not just international traffickers. It's a lot of everyday, everywhere things going on. Um, my husband works in the Bergen County Jail um, as a chaplain. And one of the things that used to be, things are changing, used to be if you were a pedophile and you were in the penal system, you would be persecuted by all the other inmates. Murderers would, would, I mean, you really had to watch your back. But you put a dollar sign on it today, and it's just business. And so things have changed. Parents traffic their kids, but that's not anything new. Another friend of mine, over 50 years ago, in I, an Irish, in Irish section of Long Island, middle class Irish section of Long Island, she was trafficked by her mom. So this is a much deeper problem than we, can, we recognize. And our stats are constantly changing because of that. So what does human trafficking look like globally? It looks like child brides. These little girls aren't going to a christening or some special pageant. They are being married off. In nearly 100 nations, this is legal. Many of those nations are part of the United Nations. Some of those nations have been on our um, commission for um, uh, human rights, our human rights commission for the United Nations. So it was counterculture to bring this up and say this is wrong. So much so that it wasn't until a year and a half to two years ago that Samantha Powers our ambassador, the US ambassador to the UN, stood up and said, this is wrong and it's slavery. Now our overseas agencies, they've been identifying this for a long time. Little girls like that, they have babies prematurely. It tears them on the inside out. They become incontinent, rejected in communities and, and in countries that don't have job opportunities, education. So they're just basically thrown away. And humanitarian organizations have been picking these girls up giving them homes, giving them hope, giving them uh, education. And some of them, they can be repaired surgically. 
But th this is what human trafficking recovery is. It's picking up these broken lives, picking them up and helping them to become, to overcome. And so that's why we need to stand up in solidarity when we see something wrong. Now, I am so glad that March of this year, for the first time ever, um, we actually have policy on this. But it is 2016, and we've known this for decades and have done nothing. Another form of, uh, actually three other forms of human trafficking globally. Now, typically, we see these mostly overseas, not so much in the United States, but we have child rights in the United States. It's not legal, but there are certain sects and communities, uh, secret communities, and they, they're prosecutable, but they have protective communities that, that keep it all on the down low. And in the same way, these are generally like, um, we, we have here, we have organ trafficking, um, we have cases in the United States of organ trafficking. It's not that common, but overseas, $20,000 for a kidney. It's pretty serious. Um, but there are some organs that you only have one of, and there are some organs you cannot live without, and there are people that are harvested for those organs today in the world. Sometimes they're even victims of other kinds of human trafficking. Once they're done with that, their trafficker will then use their parts. Um, also, not to be controversial, but I don't know if you guys remember the um, the under um, the the footage um, with the Planned Parenthood and all of that, with the, the the baby parts and the. Um, if that were ever prosecuted, or if it was discovered that yes, they were being charged, which that wasn't proven or anything, but that would have been something that would be that would have been dealt with under our human trafficking laws. So it's kind of macabre, but it's, it's a reality globally and in the United States. Um, forced begging also. Now we have begging in the United States. In fact, my, my husband used to be a, a stockbroker, and he, I, probably before some of you were born, the, the Twin Towers, there used to be this mountain of escalators. And at the bottom, like mass of humanity, <laughs> we would go through that uh, area every day. And my husband was, this is before I knew him and before we were married, um, he was walking down there with his friends going to work, and his, he was about to give a beggar some cash. And he goes, oh, don't give that guy any money. He lives in my building, he probably makes more than both of us do. So there's always begging in the United States, but not the kind of begging where the trafficker is around the corner taking the cash, and you're intentionally being maimed and broken so that people will give you more cash. Um, this is a reality in our world today. And child soldiers. Child soldiers, whether the government forces them to be a soldier or whether um, contra organizations like Joseph Coney's um, army or uh, where they swoop in and they, um, they, you know, they take kids and they often make them kill their own family and they so traumatize them and it's a form of human trafficking. Now this is really ugly, but again, I want to remind you, we're going to get to the the, the part that you feel empowered, because it's really about empowering you. Um, slavery, um, labor trafficking. Labor trafficking is the number one form of human trafficking globally. It is the number two form of human trafficking in the United States. So the difficult thing about labor trafficking is it looks a lot like kind of everyday everything. It tastes like you know a lot of things that we ate today. Um, the top two crops, our chocolate, our cocoa, cocoa beans, and coffee. In fact, it doesn't matter if you pay five dollars for your coffee at Starbucks, or six dollars or whatever it is now, or you know a dollar at the local um, you know 7-Eleven. Most of the coffee available in the United States today that we drink on a regular basis is slave coffee. So um, one of the things that we want to do is bring awareness, not to condemn, but just like um, you know we we have our our carbon footprint and we want to make a difference and impact our our ecosystem in a positive way we need to recognize we're connected to everybody around this globe and that we have slaves working for us today producing the food we've eaten the the fabric and the clothes that we wear um, things that are mined in our cell phones and all kinds of things so let's get educated there's a, um, a really cool website it's called slaveryfootprint.org and you can answer a few questions 
And at the end of it, they tell you how many slaves you own, basically. How many slaves are working for you. And the idea is to get that number down. Because you, you can make a difference if you make a conscious effort. If I make a conscious effort, we can really impact what's going on globally. If we demand um, changes, we can get changes. There's actually a law that was passed, uh, a federal law, that requires for chocolate, people who make chocolate in our country, that um, by a certain year that they have to be compliant with the anti-human trafficking laws. So, but there's a ramp up time. <laughs> um, but it's, it ha I, I ask you just to consider to research and to understand that this, this is a lot of everyday everything everywhere. It can be someone working in a diner. There was a case in California of a nursing home that was staffed by all victims of human trafficking. We've had um, trafficking bus um, uh, uh, for contractors in, in New Jersey. We've had braiding salon bus. We've had um, tomato farm bus. A lot of times our, our made in America companies or our farming companies, they will subcontract their labor, labor force so they don't always know what's going on. So changing laws changing procedures that require us to be aware because it's going on right here in New Jersey and right here in our country. And so there's a lot of things we can do. And by the way, you see the, the lady getting her nails done. Um, in that scenario, it can be the person doing the nails or maybe the pimp wants their girl to look good so she's getting her nails done and sitting in that seat. In either case, it can be in a nail salon. It looks like a lot of every day, everywhere, everything. The number one form of human trafficking in, in New Jersey and in the United States is sex trafficking. Sex trafficking comes in a lot of different forms. Here are a few. The majority of pornography, by the way, the majority, the vast majority of pornography available today is what we call slave porn. That means the people in the pictures and images are slaves. Chat, prostitution. And again, these are legal. Some of these are legal organizations, like stripping. Strip clubs aren't aren't trafficking organizations, but a lot of times we've found, we've seen with um, people that we've served is some of them come into strip clubs and they get trafficked from that point. Traffickers will come in. There are certain there are certain um, strip clubs that are known. Once a girl comes, works a little bit, they disappear. I went to high school with two girls that disappears after working um, in a Seattle strip club. And um, there was a documentary recently made called Chosen. And there was a, a girl in Arizona that was groomed and brought to the strip clubs in Seattle. So some are, are tied, evidently tied to human trafficking, not all. Um, but you see this girl right here with the tattoo. A lot of times um, victims of human trafficking and sex trafficking can be branded. One of the myths Another myth about human trafficking is that if they are not bound, then they, they can get free. If you see them walking by themselves, well, surely they're free. No, they're not. In fact, if you want to understand the mental capacity, the, the situation in, in the mind of a victim of human trafficking, you have to understand that, that they have almost double the rates of PTSD as our combat military. So they're in the 67 percentile, our combat military, it's, it's in the 30 percentile. Um, victims of human trafficking also um, have a, a, a syndrome, a trauma bond called Stockholm Syndrome, which it, it ties them to their trafficker. And this is how it kind of happens in layman's terms. It's like abuse, abuse, sleep deprivation, um, starvation, abuse, 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 and a moment of kindness. Here's a hamburger. Um, abuse, 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 abuse. Here's, you can, you can sleep a few hours tonight. Abuse, 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 and it, it just, it, it destabilizes everything about you. And so that person, that trafficker becomes, not like God, but, but becomes the source of all good in that person's life. So feelings of gratitude, loyalty, romantic feelings even, can arise in a victim of human trafficking to the point where they cannot advocate for themselves because they've been so systematically brainwashed. And so it takes us to advocate for them. It takes us to ask some questions. Um, many times victims of human trafficking will lie for the trafficker. They will do everything. And part of it is fear, fear of their, for their own safety, fear for their family. Um, but also, they, they believe sometimes 
Um, they think it's their fault. Time and time again, victims that we've helped, you know, they'll say, oh yeah, I know, I was trafficked. But you know, I really shouldn't have done this, and that's really why. And they will self-blame. Just like a, a person that's been molested. We have to start the conversation for them to recognize. We have to start saying, it's not your fault, it's not right, and there's help. And that's what we as a community, we need to start that conversation. When I was a kid, the good touch, bad touch message was started to be taught in schools. And that was the context for people to get help. And to also report if it was happening to someone they knew. To let them know this wasn't normal, and it wasn't okay, and there was help for them. How I Met My Trafficker. For most people, that age range, just simply being young, that is the number one, that is the number one commonality for all victims of human trafficking, that age range. The second is, the second indicator of, of, uh, of being at risk is if you've been sexually abused. The FBI current stats in, in sexual abuse are for females by the time they're, um, people in America, females, by the time they reach the age of 18, one out of three will have been molested or sexually violated. One out of three. That's a whole lot of us. That's a lot of us in this room, statistically. And for guys, one in five. So that's a risk factor. That's a common risk factor. But there are plenty of people that had no risk factor except for their age. Um, these are just some typical ways that traffickers meet their kids. I don't have library in there. The library is becoming a very popular place for, for people to meet their trafficker because they're usually, you know, in the municipal parking lot, often <laughs> next to the school. There are computers you can chat with strangers and plan, plan to meet up and maybe go for coffee and who knows. And, and it's not like, you know, you're, you're not willfully going with them. It's not like your parents go, like, oh, they're studying at, at the library. They're, oh, everything's good. Traffickers have learned to, to invade all of those spaces and to create those spaces, even, even job fairs, legitimate looking jobs. There are, there are examples of fake families that have real jobs and, and they are just like sleeper cells waiting to catch. They, they'll use oftentimes other students um, to be bait in the school system to bring them out. Um, Shauna, Shauna McNewell um, was one of them. But, here, I'm gonna just change the slide. But house of worship, sleepers, foster, foster parents, they've met them um, as foster parents, apps in the mall, um, in, in the, at movie theaters, in the bathrooms. One of my really good friends, her, her daughter, they were in a very protective faith-based community, um, homeschooled, like every protective measure possible, and she was trafficked. With, by a trusted friend at the bathroom in a movie theater. So this is how it happens all the time. Also, particularly in New Jersey, and particularly when it comes to gangs, a growing area we come up against a lot is, is people don't want to talk to their kids about this because it's ugly, and they feel like it's going to make them lose their innocence. When the opposite is true. They can be in a very vulnerable situation because of lack of knowledge that makes them susceptible of actually losing their innocence. So, oh, another thing we want to talk about is, is demand. Are we running out of time? Okay. So demand is a big issue, but I want to get to, I want, I want to challenge you to start having those conversations about how you view other people. Um, as a culture, as a school, as a community, the PIP culture that is popular in our nation. By the way, New Jersey, the last three years, in New Jersey, the number one costume for Halloween was baby pimp. So we need to have a conversation about what we're glorifying, what, we're, what, what we think is even funny, so we can end demand. So I want to talk to you just for a second about what you can do about it. This is one of our outreaches. We've been doing seven outreaches in New Jersey um, since our Super Bowl. The soap outreaches were launched in New Jersey. What it is is soap, hotel soap labeled with human trafficking, um, hotline number. Teresa Flores, my friend, she was uh, victimized over th like 30 years ago. And she said, what would have reached me in my worst hour? I was only allowed to be alone um, in the bathroom washing up in between people. 
And so those bars of soap with that hotline number, if we put them in hotels, especially when they're packed full of people, maybe a victim will be helped. So we've been leading these outreaches um, since our Super Bowl, but these outreaches have been going on all over our country for the last seven years, and countless victims of human trafficking have been rescued. What we do is it's, a, it's just an hour training and then we mobilize in teams of four, go to four hotels. We give the staff of the hotels soap, area um, uh, posters, of, uh, pictures of area missing children, and packets of information. And every time we've had a, a soap outreach, again, we had this, this last spring, seven, but we had a seventh outreach, every time at least one of those kids were identified by hotel staff while we're there. And everything, uh, law enforcement takes over after that. The last two we did in Atlantic City, that we did a back-to-back -back one, um, there were four children identified while our volunteers were there. Two of us happened while our volunteers were there, there and another one happened the following, uh, that week. So this is an effective outreach, and just one of the many ways we want to help engage you in abolition. These are some other ways we can help engage you. Um, we have a, a toolkit, we have all kinds of resources. If you want to find out about any of these resources, you can email us, go to our website, they're available to you because it's empowering you to end slavery, to do something about it. Just simply knowing that hotline number. Posting that hotline number, that text number. We have, we have posters that you can put out in your community, on, on your camp, at the, at the washing, at the laundromat, on your, it, it's at Starbucks, and just get that information out there. That'll save a life. That'll empower people to report. I'm Mandy Leverett, and I want to help empower you to end slavery in New Jersey. Thank you.